we uh, are going to have, so I'd like to ask all the speakers and chairs of uh, the sit up front. And uh, we're going to do what we've done in previous years and, and have a so-called town hall discussion. Uh, let's go off. Um, um, and um, and what I thought I, I I'm going to make a, a, a bring up one possible subject of discussion. I would like to not to go back over what we discussed last time. Although the situation, as was remarked, has gotten even worse. Uh, there's not much we can do uh, about the economic uh, situation and budget cuts. Um, but, and then I'll, I'll let people on the panel make some remarks about uh, science in the high schools, which is uh, what we all care about and, one of the, and the reason we hold these uh, annual conferences and how the situation can be improved. And we all know how bad the situation is. One, so I will have the panel say um, whatever remarks they want to and then ask for people to talk from the audience. I would like you, if you um, wish to contribute, ask questions, or make comments, to identify yourselves. You know, Just start out by saying, I am so-and-so from so-and-so. <clears throat> Um, we're also interested, of course, in getting advice about how to uh, uh, improve or perfect or change um, the way we do things here with these conferences, although uh, uh, all of you keep on saying it's perfect, just leave it the way it is, but make sure I can come back. Uh, um, and the, other and the other question we're always interested in is how we can reach a wider audience. And uh, again, I really would like to encourage you to spread the word. A lot of you have learned about these conferences, not from the ads or mailings that we engage in, but from, from your uh, fellow teachers. So um, the, the topic I thought uh, is of interest um, to me and, and to some of us around here uh, is um, what is an acute national problem, simply not so much a lack of money, but the lack of people in science, in, in uh, secondary school education. Uh, I've seen some numbers, which my colleague Lars Bilston showed me recently, production of high school teachers in science, in physics, but in particular around the country, and it's uh, you know uh, things are bad nowadays. They're going to get much better in 20 years from now, just uh, given the rate, the way we're producing uh, and attracting young people to uh, to science education. And I'd be very interested in what your uh, opinion is about how that can be improved. I mean, there are lots of there are lots of reasons. Obviously, lack of money, lack of good conditions, uh, lack of respect. Uh, I can imagine you might bring those up. There are things that where society and governments are to blame. There are places, obviously, where universities are to blame. Uh, in many of the universities, such as this one, uh, science departments don't regard it as their particular responsibility to train uh, or attract uh, potential uh, teachers at the secondary school level. Um, they usually delegate that responsibility to education departments. So, uh, but I'd be very interested, uh, I think, in in your um, feeling about this problem in general and about how one might go about uh, easing the situation, improving matters. Uh, and with that, let me see whether there anyone on the panel wishes, in the absence of stimulus from you, to add anything. Should I stand up? Yeah. 
So uh, I guess there's lots of things that I could say, but maybe I'll just say, just uh, focus on one thought, which is the difference between doing stuff and death by PowerPoint. So um, I don't know exactly how to fix this, because at a place like Caltech, obviously every kid has to have had AP everything. And not only that, they have to have done super well. But um, here's an observation. So kids, I, I teach freshman biology now, and I teach the, every kid at Caltech, no matter who they are, takes five terms of physics, five of math, two of chemistry, and one of biology. And I have the, bi the ones that are doing biology and don't want to be in there. And the reason they don't is because we, we find out on the first day it's because of AP biology. And so I decided to start a new course, uh, which is purely lab-based. We don't do any lectures at all. And it's related to what I said about we go to the pond and try and find out over 10 weeks using DNA sequencing and microscopy what's in there. And lots of end up changing their major, actually. So I guess my thought, my observation, which I don't think will help you at all, but because I think you're constrained. But I, if, you know, if I had a magic wand, I would quit making people have to do all the stuff, you know, all check off all the boxes, and instead go out and explore the world and do it for a long time, you know? So that's... <laughs> well, tell you the truth, uh, I really don't have any uh, wisdom about <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, well, <laughs> all I was saying, I, I don't have any any wisdom about uh, uh, you know secondary uh, uh, school science uh, uh, teaching, uh, but uh, <coughs> precisely because of that, uh, I uh, you know wanted to basically bounce uh, bounce the question and uh, you know what can we do to uh, to help and uh, you know not just in the sense of uh, you know having a one uh, one day uh, you know meeting and uh, you know tell you about science that uh, you know we happen to be particularly excited about um, but you know sort of along the lines of you know thinking globally acting uh, locally uh, you know you know few of us few of us who are actually in Santa Barbara you know can uh, try to go and do things uh, locally uh, we attract uh, uh, physicists from all over the place and uh, you know uh, Lars Bilstein uh, that uh, they already <laughs> mentioned about in particular um, brought up the point uh, of, uh, you know, perhaps we can use the opportunity of uh, educating scientists who come here in what they can do locally. So my question is, uh, what is it that uh, you would like somebody from, uh, you know, your neighborhood, uh, you know, come and help you with? No, there's something that is related to what uh, Robert said. Say we are in a situation in which I think that science in the general uh, public has a bad name. No? Uh, you know, there is all the discussion about uh, global warming, whether it is true, it is not true, and uh, let's not speak about the fact that the evolution itself is under attack in the general public. So I, I know that you are say, those who teach evolution are on the front line for that. And one of the reasons is probably that we have a tendency to uh, provide our students, by and large, with the results of science without letting them understand really what the method is and the fact that it is just a way of carefully uh, checking your hypothesis, carefully checking what follows from these hypotheses, go back, go down to the bench and show that in fact from that hypothesis something really follows in nature really. And the relevant point there is that this has to be transmitted and it, it is really the most important things that we have to get our students to learn. What is the scientific method? and that they can all, cannot understand it unless they do actually some sort of, uh, probably a little bit of a project, which is in some sense, which is scientific. It's not just a verifying something, but just take a little problem and try to find a way of solving it. So 
I know that there are so many constraints to do that, but this is probably the most important thing to do. So hi, I didn't get introduced yet, so I'm supposed to talk after the lunch break. I'm, my name is Richard Nee, and I'm from Germany. I used to be here as a postdoc for three years, working with, with spores mainly. And what I don't, it's been quite some time since I've been in high school, I, did, I don't have any kids that recently went through that either. <laughs> but so one thing I, I thought I'd, I, I'd want to mention is um, some, in, in, the, in the city I come from, Göttingen, so there's a, there's sort of this, inst they, they got an institute put up which provides lab space for students in high school <coughs> classrooms, essentially. And incidentally, that was my mother who put it up, but <laughs> that's, that's sort of an aside. <laughs> but it's sort of fairly, fairly sophisticated lab space. They have sort of a biology department, chemistry, physics, and sort of an information technology space, and whole sort of entire sort of 20 people, so sort of classrooms can come there with their teachers, sp spend a couple of days there, do sort of experiments. The mo main focus on chemistry and molecular biology, but they have sort of quite a bit of physics too. And what they, what they, for example, do is, you know, they bring their burger from McDonald's and then do sort of species-specific PCR and try to figure out what kind of meat is really in there. Is it sort of <laughs> <laughs> is it pork or is it? <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you get surprises. <laughs> And well, they also have sort of, um, they do sort of the kind of experiments you were talking about. They sort of transfect the um, so do sort of glowing bacteria and all kinds of these things. So they need some kind of genetically modified, sort of, well, they have sort of S1 type, type lab space. And yes, yeah, so people can come and do whatever they want. And so the different institutes, the scientific <laughs> institutes, research institutes throughout the city, so it's a university city, they provide sort of the expertise and so some of the equipment and stuff. And basically, yeah, guide this guide this enterprise um, in what they're doing, and it's been tremendously success successful. So they run at full capacity, having sort of roughly 100 students a day there, and from all over the country, from neighboring countries in Europe too. So, so that might be. Well, if if you guys are interested, I can stick in a couple of slides in my talk, just to basically show give some impression of what's going on there. Okay, so now I'm actually well, let's open up the uh, floor and and see what you all want to talk about, and let's wait for the microphone. So I'll <laughs> start with the front row. Good morning. My name is Dave Wittenberg. I teach in Bakersfield, beautiful Bakersfield. Sorry, I did throw that in there. Um, you mentioned that you weren't a science person in high school. So one of the questions is, is what ignites kids' passion? Because that's the key. They have to be passionate about it in order for them to want to, you know, pursue it. So, how do we ignite high school students' passions in in science? That would be one of my questions that maybe you can answer. Uh, you talked about, you know, kids doing science in the summer. Uh, that process is in place, but it's very much the kids reach out and try to figure out. The, the movement is from the students up to where those programs are available. I think if you could, we could figure out ways to reverse the direction of that, where it makes it fairly easy for them to find something like that by being reached out to by the university. I think that would help students because I have lots of students who want to do it, but you know they're unsure how to do it, uh, and they don't know what's available to them. And I, you know, the internet's a great thing for that, but you, they still have to go out there and do that. So recruitment from this side down to the high school would be a wonderful thing. Um, other than that, I think uh, you learn by doing. I, I, I agree, AP Biology, ugh, God, it's like a vocabulary class. And uh, it's, you know, it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Uh, Inquiry-based learning would be great. So for me as a teacher, I'd like to be, come here at UCSB or some other place and do some work here on things that I can take back to my classroom uh, without having the equipment that you have here uh, and realizing the constraints that we have about what we can do in class. What types of inquiry-based, hands-on stuff can we use as the springboards to talk about the specific concepts that the state of California requires us to teach within you know, within our year that we have with our students. OK. 
Okay. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> Uh, I'm John Anderson, I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and um, to, to take uh, your comments and, and go a step further with it, um, I, I think that at um, the university level, having a professor put in a good word to the right student uh, is also effective. Uh, in other words, uh, a student that, uh, that you see that potentially would make a good teacher and simply saying something such as, have you considered, uh, have you considered teaching physics? Uh, or, you know, have you considered education? Um, in, in working with future teachers myself, I, I've found that students have said that that was a, a very effective comment coming from a professor at the university level. Um, and, and, uh, and to borrow a line from Teach for, for America's uh, propaganda, um, it, it's a great place to start. And, uh, and then what they do from there is up to them. Actually, I'm on coming back to my original question about uh, teacher, uh, educating teachers, how many of you, I'm interested in, this is a cross-section of physics, biology, mostly physics teachers, uh, how many of you um, did their, got a bachelor's degree in physics? So that's about half. And um, is that about you know your estimate of the right number, or is that just the people who will come to the KITP conferences? It's a third. It's a third. Okay. So uh, how valuable do you think it would be, uh, given that there are large numbers of people who end up teaching science who haven't had not necessarily a, um, a rigorous science education in universities to have national programs that of sort of re-education or, or uh, fellowships that would be made available for educating people who decide later on that they want to teach science. I'm Sherry Brown, Tucson, Arizona, and there actually is a program, it has been around for almost 20 years, is the Modeling Physics Program out of ASU. Um, I was in Washington State, I'm a chemistry teacher by degree, I started off as an art major, um, so really circuitous route into physics. But their training of te physics teachers, you need to realize that where does Singapore send their teachers for their summer training? They send them to Tempe, Arizona. Because why? That's where the great methodology is. That's where they're training lots of great teachers. But the NSF funding for the grant has run out. And now, of course, it's all state-based. And so if workshop leaders around the country can actually get a workshop funded in their state that's one avenue, but Arizona has run out, you know, there is no more NSF funding because the method was prove it. So it's not research anymore. Um, <laughs> it's over. Um. I was the woe is me, Pam Whiffen from Arizona also. I was the woe is me two years ago that had, you know, the chicken little the sky was falling and you were all like, can't be getting that bad. Well, it is. Well, I do want to share a positive thing. And I went to the launch of the discovery. Okay. Now imagine you have over 100,000 people lining the streets throughout Orlando. 27,000 people poured into Kennedy Space Center. I'm, I went with NASA and we set some booths up along the causeway. And what we did was we went through the crowd and every engineer and everybody that was in any way connected with science wore a name tag that said, ask me about being a mechanical engineer or ask me about being, and you can't imagine the enthusiasm. And when, when Discovery lifted off, the crowd was weeping. And people were saying, oh, science and science. And I was like, yeah, do you know that there's, you know, and they, they, everybody's saying, what do you mean? You mean this, is, this program is ending? Yes, the program is ending. So it was a very simple thing. It was just, and this was just an idea we had in a brainstorm session. Let's have people wear a name tag. And you saw little kids and you saw adults. Now, I will say a third of the crowd were from other countries. Very, very large international uh, contingency, the largest I've ever seen at a launch. But to actually see the joy of science, and you looked around and you knew those children were going to be involved, and you, you could just feel the excitement. That's something that just in when you share just a portion of your passion with somebody, whether you go out to a school for one day, you have a huge impact because you're a real scientist. We as teachers, we're the mouthpieces, but we're not the scientists. Where you're in between. And that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see a lot more being active within your communities. 
Um, I'm Mike Sinclair from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and and I'm not a, was not a physics major, but I was a science education major with a very rigorous physics and chemistry background and mathematics as well. Uh, and there were a lot of opportunities to go through that. I'm, I, my background in biology is minimal, but my physics was very strong even though there was a specific physics program, but there was no education link in the physics department. Uh, I picked up a lot of my experience, though, from the uh, National Science Foundation Research Experience for Teachers, which is a summer program typically anywhere from four to eight weeks, depending on the university. And that was a good place to pick up additional training. But I, I want to just kind of second John's comments as well. One of the things I noticed, I've worked at, Net, at uh, Notre Dame for a, a number of summers, and I've worked at a couple of other um, laboratories uh, through the RET program. And one thing I noticed is that a number of the professors uh, there is a distinct dichotomy, particularly at research facilities, research universities, in the students who are going to be scientists and those who are not. And I'm not saying teachers, but not. And, and I think a lot of the students recognize that, well, if I'm a teacher, I'm not in that group. And I think that's a disservice to our students. We're, we're encouraging our students to go into science. Science is a spectrum, just like everything else. And that includes everything from teaching all the way up to doing pure research. And I think we do a disservice by simply saying, well, maybe you're not good enough to do science per se, but you should be a teacher. I, I think we need to kind of shift away from that because there are students that I've known that have come out of places like Caltech and Princeton and Notre Dame who would make damn good teachers as well as damn good scientists. Art uh, Alt Schiller. I am retired, but still, uh, I was a physics teacher for 33 years, and um, still hanging on to the staff of LA Valley College uh, in math and astronomy. But uh, my thought is, um, locally in California, I'm, I'm from LA Unified originally. Uh, Steve Oppenheimer uh, is a uh, science, a biologist at Cal State Northridge. And he has a research program going there for many years. My students made use of it. And he, did, he encourages student research in a journal that he publishes. He's gotten uh, a lot of uh, you know, uh, support. Uh, I think one of the main supporters is the Van Nuys Airport. But students are doing research. They get it published in a journal. It becomes part of their resume. At the end of each year, he has a poster session on the campus. And there's some super stuff. And there are rewards for the teachers that get involved, similar to what uh, is done here you know, for your uh, presentations. And uh, it's a super way to do things. And I think if more colleges did that and had more students involved, because it's, it's just really sort of uh, a one-man operation with him, and it's worked very well. And I think he even got a presidential award for it uh, recently. So I'm just saying something like that done on a broader scale might generate an awful lot of momentum. I'm Colin Dennis from uh, Minnesota. And maybe I took your question very simplistically, just at a very low level. But if there was one thing that I would have liked to see more of today, <laughs> It would be that each one of you in your presentations also included some very tiny little simple lab that we could do with our students that would show a piece of the principle you were talking about, like packing DNA or something with a jack in a box or a spring or something very simple, very low tech that we could say, look, this gentleman did this, this presentation, but the principle is here and we can do this in the class and look how it connects to this much deeper, more sophisticated analysis. You guys have the knowledge to do that. If I do a packing the packing the jack-in-the-box lab, I will never be quite as sure that I really got the essence of what you want to say as you don't, who, who know where it applies and where it doesn't. And that would be my, my thought. Ann Stafford from Boise, Idaho. And I have a question for Rob. Um, I heard you say that in your junior year you left high school. What would have made you stay? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, that was a little too brutal. But um, I don't know. You know, it was my sisters and I, we all bailed on high school, actually. And I took seven years, and I was actually an electrician here in Santa Barbara. 
uh, before I went back to school again. I really found it to be an incredibly horrible experience. Like, um, maybe at lunch I can talk to some of you about it. Um, so, but no, no, it's just that I, I'm sure if I'd hung, I had hung, I think I said at the very beginning of my talk, I think I told you the most important thing I said today, which is at Caltech, I ask the incoming physics grad students, how many of you had a teacher that blew your mind? 75% is the answer. One person. So I guess I found that person outside of school on April 30th, 1977 at my friend's house. He told me how the radius of the Earth was figured out. You know, that's, how, that's what happened to me, honestly. So I had such a person like that, too. So I'm a real believer in the cult of personality. That's, that's really my answer. <laughs> My name is Michelle Townsley, and I teach in a middle school here in Oxnard, not far. And I'm with you 100% if my parents wouldn't let me drop out of school. And I didn't go to college. I, well, I, ultimately, I went to UCSB and got a degree here, but I didn't go straight to college, and I thought everybody who did was a lunatic, because why would you go to school when you don't have to? Then I was involved in Tri-County's Math Project here and Tri-County Science Project here at UCSB, and they had you do something where you had to write a biography of where you use science in your life. And it turned out everything I loved in my life was scientifically based. And I teach middle school where I teach more than one subject, math and science. And I think the hands-on thing is the key because I was, working, I was working on a dive boat and there was a biology professor on the dive boat who said, hey, who wants to take my ecology of the coastal waters class? And that's what hooked me into going to school because I was doing science. I, I, well, I liked it because I was scuba diving all the time. Every weekend I was out here at the Channel Islands scuba diving. That's what I did. I worked on a dive boat and um, commercial fished. But I was doing science. And in his class, I was doing it for fun. I wasn't going to college. I was taking his class. Then I took a French class because I wanted to. And then I took some other class to make more money because I was also a dental assistant. Well, then I was hooked into college. Um, so I really think it has to be something where you get the kids fired up and do things. But here in California, and I imagine in the rest of the country, you're given a timeline. And I only have 50 minutes a class. And to set up a lab is crazy. But you could do an ongoing experiment if somebody wasn't going to yell about you about your benchmark test next week because the long-term lab isn't necessarily going to correlate to what's on that benchmark test. But the kid's doing science and they're totally into it. So we need to somehow have a shift with that and the no child left behind is not helping that at all. Uh, I'm Eric Walters. I'm from the Marymount School of New York and I teach all girls. And we have a very unique situation in that we can create our own curriculum. So one of the great things that we've been able to do is that our curriculum, our science curriculum, is about 70% experiment, hands-on, inquiry-based learning so that we're not doing PowerPoints and things like that and we're pretty happy with that. One, two other things I just wanted to say, sort of based on what other people have said. First of all, our teachers are all scientists, so we present ourselves as scientists and teachers. And when we do our annual Women in Science luncheon, where we bring young alum back to the school. Um, we don't always get one alum that's done this, but we always bring in a science teacher from another school that's a young woman, and she's on the panel, and we usually try and get a physics or a chemistry teacher to come back and talk to the kids. So we found that in the last 10 years, we've probably had three or four girls that have gone into science education, and we're pretty, out of our population, we're pretty happy with that. <coughs> Education out of probably 400, which is not overly into science. Probably 20% of our graduating class goes into science. Yeah, um, I'm. <coughs> excuse me. I'm Eric Henry. I'm from Bellingham, Washington. And I want to piggyback on something that uh, Pamela was saying. She was talking about um, being at the launch of Discovery and seeing people wearing name tags. And one of the things I, I often think is that uh, there's 
often, I think, a disconnect between scientists and communication with the general public. I think that was a really good example, it sounds like, of communication with the general public. But, you know, ministers communicate well with the public. Reporters communicate well. Um, politicians communicate well with the public. And I think the public often sees scientists as, as people who work alone in a laboratory and do some weird thing that doesn't really impact their life and they're kind of smart and arrogant and, um, and well, whatever. Um, and that's not really true. You know, we go around with iPods and whatever. It's impacting our life directly all the time. Um, and I find, as a teacher, that I have a hard time, um, you know, even one-on-one -on -one with students, helping them understand how how significant science is in their lives. And, and, uh, and one of the things we often talk about is, is how in science we need to really communicate with the public. And I try to teach students to do that in their, in their reporting. Um, and I think that would be a good thing for professional scientists as well, to find ways to really communicate with the public at the level the public is at, um, which is often um, a level of being a little bit closed and not not really understanding a lot of what's going on. Um, yeah. Jed Lederman, Los Angeles. Um, I'm glad the issue of benchmark tests came up. That's where I was going to go before. As a lot of you probably know, there's more and more of an emphasis on standardized testing. It's worse at the lower levels because a lot of bureaucrats don't understand what I teach, but it's it's creeping up. And uh, yeah, sure, I look at the benchmarks, and of course, I want my students to know something, and yeah, I give tests. But there's just such an emphasis on teaching to the test. And I've worked with and talked to a lot of scientists, including you guys here, and I've, I don't think I can remember anybody ever saying, I was really inspired by a standardized test, and that's why I'm a scientist. <laughs> One thing I would really like to see is scientists like you, and, and it, it wouldn't take too much, going on record somewhere, on the news, in an article, in a petition, on the internet. I know not everybody agrees on this, but um, saying that, that there are other ways of teaching and that we don't support a total push toward the crazy politics of blaming everything on uh, teaching and a particular score of standardized test. Um, well, uh, maybe we stop here for a moment. This, you know, this, I think we're all in agreement that um, No Child Left Behind and the movement that that has given rise to and standardized tests and benchmarking and all that is bad for education. And, in you know, we don't do that at universities. Um, it amazes me, however, um, that it's continuing, that the opposition isn't greater. You ask for scientists like ourselves to speak up and say this is not. The trouble is, to some extent, um, we don't have particular authority on speaking about what is or is not. Uh, I mean, we have intuition, but we, we don't have a position. So most scientists you will find are you know, not going to speak up in areas where they don't feel that they have authority. Um, what uh, surprises me, however, that, that you guys don't have a much more organized effort in uh, dealing with this problem or trying to educate. What? It will make no difference. Well, that, that is a, that's an admission of pessimism and defeat. What still amazes me is that you guys, from what I sense, uh, are upset and voice your... Um, we've gone to school board meetings and such. not a pessimism or defeat. It's not so much a we've, school We've done stuff, and we uh -huh. try to get parents involved, and so no, it's not pessimism at all. So but the reality is, they list the politicians, I'm from Texas, okay? we have our own issues there. <laughs> And I don't really need this thing, but I mean, I'm from Texas, so we have our own issues there, obviously. Um, he's from Kansas, so, you know, same sort of thing. 
<laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, we're kind of compadres here. But no, it, it, I, you know, I, I've I've been doing this 14 years, and that's not as long as some people, but it's a lot longer than others. And you know, what I've seen is just heartbreaking. Not only in Texas, but almost everywhere in this country. And, you know, we do try, I mean, I'm very active. I'm active at UT Southwestern Medical Center, and I've talked to scientists there, and they said pretty much the same thing you do. A lot of them just don't want to get involved for different reasons. Um, so I've made efforts. I've talked to parents. I've talked to my PTA. I'm on a national board at National Science Teachers Association, so I'm anything but pessimistic, obviously. But I'm also realistic. And the legislature in Texas just doesn't give a damn, period. So there's only so much we as teachers can do if we can't get parents involved. That's where it needs to come from, okay? They need to hear from parents, and that's, in my 14 years, I've, because they vote, exactly. In my 14 years, I've seen parents less involved. Now, that's not a scientific survey. That's just my own school. But that's what I've seen. So if you don't get parents involved, Teachers can talk about things all day long. They don't care. If they cared, I wouldn't be using a textbook for 1999. Okay? So no, it's not pessimism. It's realism. There's a difference. I just have a question for the panel. Have you seen, since Nickleby's come out 10 years ago, have you seen a noticeable decline in the quality of your science students? We can bitch and moan about how bad it is in teaching these standardized tests, but do you see your students coming in that are, I don't know, I don't want to say word inferior, but you've seen a noticeable decline in their ability to carry out an experiment, to think uh, intuitively, inquiry-based, et cetera? case, the, the sample is much too small. You know, you're really dealing with the tail of the distribution, and uh, it doesn't uh, teach you very much about what the typical situation is. And uh, what is certainly uh, you know, very clear to me, and uh, you know, again, I know very little about secondary education, uh, you know, aside from having you know three teenagers. You know. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, it's not um, um, it's not very easy to. Uh, uh, get them interested in science. So, you know, I personally, uh, I have failed, uh, and <laughs> and uh, you know, part of it is uh, is uh, you know, inability to communicate and uh, not being cool, and uh, so you know, as we, <laughs> um, uh, you know, so thinking, uh, um, so you know, one of the local outreach activities uh, of KATP is, you know, to send scientists to, to a local school. And uh, what, uh, what we've learned locally is that uh, it's much more effective to, uh, you know, send, uh, you know, a young uh, uh, in a postdoc, you know, preferably with an earring, um, uh, than uh, you know, for <laughs> for somebody like, <laughs> like myself to show up in the, in the classroom. That's a um, and there are really two issues. You know, one is uh, again uh, catering to uh, you know the curious and the, so the tail of the distribution. You know, uh, you know the students that um, you know will go out of the way and. Uh, uh, you know, we'll uh, so find out the course, you know, such as you know Richard described in uh, in Göttingen, although hopefully somewhere closer uh, <laughs> at hand, and uh, you know would actually uh, go and uh, and and do it all, and uh, you know the rest, uh, you know, who would uh, perhaps rather uh, you know listen to something on YouTube, so. Um, um, <laughs> 
And on the other hand, uh, so somehow what what we can uh, hope to achieve with uh, so two different categories, uh, you know, of uh, of students is, you know, on one hand, you know, give them opportunity to explore and and learn, and uh, you know, they will uh, take that opportunity. And uh, but also the fundamental question is, how do we teach the rest of the distribution, you know, some fundamentals of uh, science that uh, you know they uh, understand the difference between uh, you know memorizing uh, those uh, you know proteins, you know, Rob so very explicitly said it doesn't matter what they're called, uh, and typically you have to memorize them only because you don't understand what it is that they're doing. You know, the moment you understand that you know some protein, uh, you know acts as a glue between the two cells. I don't, I don't care what it's called, you know, coherent, you know. It's, uh, you know, the glue that holds cells together, you know, that's good enough, right? So, uh, you know, the moment we can somehow uh, explain that, uh, you know, communicate that, uh, you know, things out there in nature can be uh, understood, right? Not just, uh, you know, sort of stated uh, and uh, observed, or believed uh, that uh, one can, uh, uh, there is a scientific method which allows to explain these observations, use the explanation and uh, some logical and mathematical perhaps uh, construction to extrapolate, make predictions. And uh, there is a way of falsifying these uh, predictions. You know, the moment, uh, 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 you know, you realize that, uh, you know, the theory of evolution is not a theory anymore. It has been proven. It has been proven more than, uh, than uh, you know, any theory ever, right? But uh, we're somehow failing uh, to communicate to the uh, public at large this uh, um, nature of, uh, of science and the scientific process. And uh, I guess that's, that's it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I your comment about what we can do uh, did make me reflect because I go I teach at a community college, so actually I'm fortunate enough not to have to do a lot of these things. Um, however, uh, I go to a American Association of Physics Teachers conferences, and I go to different things. And this is really the first time. I think one-on-one -on -one people complain about the standardized tests and so forth, but I have to admit I've never heard a, um, a any kind of unified opposition at the AAPT meetings, for example. The 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 uh, workshops are primarily on how to meet the standards, how to meet these requirements. N they're not on having some kind of a unified uh, thing against them. So I, for one, the next meeting I go to, I, I will bring that up. Um, so I think perhaps you're right. I think perhaps we uh, aren't doing what we maybe could do. To, to kind of carry that further, my name is Angela Hemingway. I teach in Idaho, and I've been on the standard setting committee for the past four years. Not because I believe in standards, but because I think we should keep them very weak <laughs> and very loose. Um, but I, I would say that even, um, and I'm a biology teacher, so I'm a little fish out of water here, but I would say within physics, there's probably 10 things that you believe that every physics student should know. And uh, yeah, right, plus or minus 50, right? Okay, so, <laughs> so I think, um, again, our unified voice should be more toward, there's 10 things you would want a student from Idaho that transfers to California. You would expect if they've taken a physics course, they should know those things. And so I think our unified voice maybe should be directed more towards what are those things. And uh, you know, as a result, there is a national science uh, committee forming right now for standard settings. And I put my name on the hat on that one. And I think we need to get involved, like it or not, um, so that we can ensure that we don't have hundreds and thousands of standards to meet, but that we have a very few amount of standards that that we meet as a result of that. I'm Cliff Parker from Edwardsville, Illinois, and just to kind of go along with that, I think one thing that we can we can all do is influence our students and influence our colleagues to understand and to share with uh, the world what science is about. Um, I've heard it mentioned here before at the AP bio uh, vocabulary test. You know, I think a lot of students, I think a lot of people have the idea that that's what 
secondary science is about. Uh, and we need, we need to clearly communicate and preach over and over again. You know, these are models. These are our best attempts at uh, describing how things work. This is not dogma. Um, any way that you can communicate to your colleagues, do it different. Go ahead and communicate that. We need to, we need to do things different. Um, one of the first things that I've noticed with my students is a lot of them are more interested in sports now. Oh, sorry. I'm Lisa O'Brien from Poway High in San Diego. And um, there are a lot more sports scholarships now than anything else. And I think we need to work on getting more funding for science scholarships so that students know that you know, they can get into a good college and have it paid for by going to sciences. Um, the second thing is we need to glamorize science like sports are. So I walk into the classroom with my hat that David signed and say, look, you know, I got this signature. And then they say, well, who is that? And I go, oh, you don't know he won the Nobel Prize in physics, you know. So they just don't know who these people are because society doesn't pay attention to that. And um, the final thing is if there were only half of us who teach physics in high school who actually have physics backgrounds, if you ask elementary or middle school teachers how many of them have science backgrounds, it's even less. And so, as I think it was Rob that was saying, we should have students learning science from the time they're six like they do in other countries. We don't have scientists at those levels. And the people I've talked to at those levels don't want to teach science because they're not, they're not excited about it. So, and that comes across to their students. So we need to fix that as well. It's a very serious problem. Uh, in the United States, only survives as a scientific, technological, industrial society because we import hundreds of thousands of brains from all over the world. That is harder to do for teachers in middle schools and in high schools. So the one solution this country has to keeping uh, just an educated labor force, not to speak of tomorrow's scientists, is not available. Maybe it is. Maybe one solution to this problem will turn out to be like every other aspect of American economy to import Indians and Chinese high school teachers. Uh, but other than that, we're really faced with a crisis. I don't know what you think about that. Okay. My name is Kate Dickinson. I I live in Santa Barbara, but I work down in Oxnard. And I think I might be getting, or I feel like I might be a little off topic. Topic, but compared to the original question of why aren't there teacher science? majors going into education is I agree with, okay, we have benchmarks and I like inquiry and hands-on stuff. But when I went, did my undergrad here in the chemistry department and I did my research in you know, quantum theory, statistical mechanics, that my, the faculty that I worked with, I think I only had one person who actually encouraged going into education, whereas I had several saying, you're a woman in a field that no one applies to in a field that is literally taking pictures of atoms and quantum modeling and DFT and stuff like that, that I became the anomaly of why I didn't want to pursue my PhD in chemistry. And of my entire graduating class of people who received their chemistry degree, I was one, one person, the only person, who did not go straight to graduate school. And so for the original question of why aren't scientists who have, I was inspired as a little kid and I had good teachers and I did hard sciences in lab and inquiry and research as an undergraduate, there was a disconnect, and my and I, this might be might be me being naive, but um, I was the first year they even offered a co you know interdisciplinary education chemistry course within the department, and there was a PhD chemist who works for the engineering department who is also the, on the education department working to build a course, and it was definitely an interesting course because no one had ever done it before but it had finally become a reality. 
And I know UCSB does a lot of outreach at you know, the K-5 level, at the high school level. CNSI does a lot of high school outreach. The materials lab does teacher outreach. But within the university program, as an undergraduate, it's either, you know, especially here as a research institution, get your PhD. Do that. That is what I think is pushed within the departments. Whereas, okay, we have a very good education department, a brand new facility, and I was one student who went on to pursue that path. So I think universities... Do you know that's increasing? Um, I know that our education department is pushing and they're putting more effort into hiring faculty. I know there's a mathematics coordinator and a, a science coordinator, but that science coordinator happens to be a chemist. Um, so they're working with that department. Um, but I guess I see the universities and scientists doing K-12 enrichment and outreach programs. But within the at the university level, there is kind of this fall off of be a scientist, but I guess teaching's okay too. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bill Deach, and uh, my wife and I are here forever, I guess, in the same seats. Um, after, after spending 36 years teaching in a upper class, white kids who, AP physics, who had a tremendous sense of entitlement, I retired. And I got a gig in an inner city community college. And I teach remedial science there, voluntarily, because nobody else wants to do it. And I have to tell you, that, you know, everybody says, complains about this, that, and the other thing, but in fact, the 500-pound gorilla in the room is the teacher. And, I, you know, I, 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 the, my students are all from these... I mean, if you had a life like they did, you wouldn't be coming to college. You'd be, you know, knocking your head on the wall. But they'd show up, and, you know, Diane can attest to this. They're so needy. They've never had a teacher that ever really sat down with them and did anything with them. You know, they just... And when I come home from class, she says, oh, what's the matter with you? I said, I'm exhausted. Because, <clears throat> like, I'll, I'll have somebody, and I always make a point of, of teaching the class something that's hard, hard to them. It's, you know, a difficult, like plotting orbits or something, you know. And they're like, they first look at it and say, and they all say in their heads, I can't do this. And then, after a while, one kid gets it. No oh, kid. You know, they're all like 35 years old, a lot of them. 20 kids, you know. <laughs> Seriously. But, and as I sit with them for an interminable amount of time, I see the light bulb go on. And it's like the most, I have to tell you, it's the best job that I've ever had. Because the rewards are just unbelievable. Now, these people are not going to be scientists. Then, you know, they're, they have plans and everything. They say, oh, I'm going to do this and the other thing. And in my head, I'm saying, uh-uh. But, you know, try. <laughs> but you're the one that makes the difference. I don't have any equipment. I have, it's the worst possible working conditions you could possibly have. There's no money there. I, you know, I mean, big classes and everything. But let me tell you, it's rewarding to get somebody that thinks they can't do anything and teach them to do something not practical, who cares, you know, for them, it's, who cares, you know. But, wow, when the light goes on, it's just unbelievable. I, just one anecdote. I had a woman, and I keep, Diane heats this story all the time. Uh, I had this one woman, 30, in her mid-30s, couple of kids, and I give numerical grades on tests. I give, she gets a 90 on the test. And she said, Professor, do you think you could put the letter grade on the test? And I said, yeah, why? She goes, I want to take this and put it on a refrigerator so my kids can see how good mommy's doing in college. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's just unbelievable. It's really very rewarding. And, it, you know, it's you. Uh, we could go on like this for a long time, but food is waiting. So we're going to adjourn to the courtyard. You know where to go.